All right. Well, hey, Celia, thank you so much for doing lunch therapy. My pleasure. I'm happy to be here. You know, I had, I think of all my patients, you and I had the most intimate beginning to all this because you've never used Zoom before. That's right. That was, that was a big hurdle to get over for us. <laughs> and we had to, we had to like, we had to walk through that together, but yes, it was good to... though. Now I'm, now I'm here and I'm confident ish. <laughs> <laughs> I even well, you, a little makeup. Well, you were saying, oh, you look lovely. You were saying though that, um, you, you hadn't used Zoom at all during the pandemic, which is amazing oh, for a business my owner. Wife and I were like, yeah, my Paula and I were like, you know, let's, we're going to make this our goal to never have to use Zoom because it sounds horrible. <laughs> <from everything. laughs> we're Paula's uh, brother is a teacher and he was just hating being on it. And everyone that I knew, you know, we're so, with both of our stores, she runs the pet store that's next door to ours that we also own together. And so the two of us are just so used to interacting with people all the mm -hmm. time and in person, and we really value that. So we just didn't want to get into a habit of connecting over, over video. It just seemed like a slippery slope. And here I am ruining everything for you. Yeah, well, it's okay. We're right at the end. So yeah. I, I think, yeah, Zoom is definitely going to fade out for sure. <laughs> I know. I, I wonder how their stock is doing. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, so Celia, so um, before we get into your therapy session, which we'll, yes. we'll go, we're going to go very deep, but I think, oh, very I, exciting. yes, as a starting <laughs> point, though, I guess a good question would be, how did you fare during the pandemic with your bookstore? I mean, how did it go for you? Was, was it difficult? Was it, I mean, because people love to cook. I mean, people started cooking more in the pandemic. So I'm curious how that was for you. Yeah. I mean, I keep saying, you know, if I owned a travel bookstore, I really would have been in bad trouble. Mm -hmm. But uh, having a cookbook store was really, really good. People really did need to cook a lot. And a lot of people needed to learn how to cook. The only thing I really hated was that my success was sort of at the cost of so many restaurateurs who are my customers and friends and colleagues mm -hmm. losing business, which was really hard to watch. Mm -hmm. But so many people responded and came in and we really upped our online sales and game and, you know, started to, I had always just had books on there that I thought were hard to get because I figured everyone would just get books on Amazon if they want to buy it online. Um, so they were books that you couldn't find there, mm -hmm. but I was really wrong. People really were willing to support me and pay full price from like Alabama, you know, people I've never uh -huh. even heard of were coming out of the woodwork and buying things from me that were, you know, probably 40% off on Amazon. So it was really heartwarming and surprising to me that people were doing that. I bought a box from you that had um, Melissa Clark's Cooking in French. I'm trying to think what I got. I was like a bunch of books that had just come out at the beginning of the pandemic. Thank and it, you. yes, well, you know, but I was happy to do it. I mean, I'm curious, like, was there a trend in terms of the kind of books people were buying during the pandemic? Oh, totally. I mean, it went in several phases that went along with the with the whole pandemic, you know, at first it was all bread baking. Oh yeah. Bread one, bread. one of the books yeah. I bought from you was artisan <laughs> sourdough or one of those sourdough books. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It was all sour, almost all sourdough. Yeah. But we were, you know, the publishers ran out, we ran out, you know, the publishers, it was really interesting. So many of the books that they had had on their lists for years, suddenly everybody wanted it. And so they all went out of print with each phase of the pandemic that came in of popularity. So first it was all, it was all the bread books and everyone was totally into it. And, and then after about three or four weeks, you could tell every single person was like, fuck this. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing it anymore. And the, the, the sales just stopped of those. Oh yeah. It, it, was, it was like musical chairs, like, ah, oh no, we have like a pile of That's so <laughs> funny. Yeah, my, uh, <laughs> my uh, sourdough starter has died an ignoble death in my exactly. refrigerator. Yeah. Exactly. You're not alone. You'll be left. Yeah. But as so many people had these, it was just crazy. So, um, so then we're stuck with all those. And then in March, of course, the Black Lives Matter movement really um, caught on fire again. I mean, people forget that it had been going before that, but really um, picked up and everyone wanted books about African-American culture and cuisine. And so those books that had been out for a, a long time, you know, Edna Lewis or um, Tony Tipton Martin's book, Jubilee, all mm -hmm. of those started selling out like crazy. Bryant Terry's vegan uh, African cookbooks, they, they all were like impossible to get so wow. 
that was really cool. And those have continued to be popular, but still they, you know, at some point it did, you know, after the publishers reprinted everything, those kind of died back down to their their more regular popularity, which is still very popular. But. I have to ask, like during that period, without naming names, because we all know who maybe I'm talking about, but like <laughs> as people were as people were called out during that period, did you uh, find, yes. did you find that their books cookbook sales went down? Yeah, that was another thing that just like stopped very suddenly after being super popular. Uh -huh. um, and so, yeah, so it's interesting. People are just sort of clawing back now to mm -hmm. uh, to the actual content of the, those cookbooks, which are is actually really, really good, I have to say. So, so what was the next yeah. trend after Black Lives Matter? Was there another trend? After oh, that? Then it just got into more the seasonal stuff, which is right. what we see every year. So, you know, as the as the summer hits, it's barbecue books and books for mom and things like that. Um, and then it gets into the fall and one pot meals and cooking like that. And then everybody was doing all the the big so cookbook publishing. There are two times of year that the big cookbooks come out from publishers and that's spring and fall. And the fall ones are kind of the heavy hitters. Mm -hmm. So in fall, all the heavy hitters come out and everybody starts buying them for Christmas and as, as presents and for themselves, they get very excited. And one thing we never used to have on our website was pre-orders of stuff. We just had it that you could, um, you know, once it came out, we would put it up on our website, but we started to realize that people really wanted to pre-order things in advance and we would get the publisher to, usually people come out and give a talk at our store and then we get them to sign it. But of course last year we couldn't. So we got the publishers to promise to send us signed book plates mm -hmm. for the books. And that was a huge help. Like the dessert person um, by Claire Saffitz. Oh yeah. You know how many of those we we sold over, since, since it came out? Oh. 600. Wow. 600. I'm a 500 square foot space spot. <laughs> That's <laughs> amazing. Incredible. And the majority of them were shipped afar. And so that was incredible, all because they gave a signed book plate. So now they're starting to see, oh, if we give these cookbook stores book plates ahead of time or, you know, promise them ahead of time, they'll put that on the pre-order and then the author will post about it and then we get all these orders. So that just That's... happened with the new Tartine Bread book. And it's and, and it's not just me. It's happening for now serving down in L.A. and Kitchen Arts and Letters and Book Larder, so, which is great. And do you personally, like if you were out buying a cookbook for yourself, does having a signed cookbook mean something to you? Because I'm, I'm just curious, like I have um, a lot, I have a lot of cookbooks and I have some of them signed because I'm friends with their authors, but it, what, yeah. what do you think? I'm curious if that means anything to you. Yeah, I have, I mean, I have to admit, I have some here that are signed, you know, they're inscribed to me from Alice Waters right. or um, Adam, you know, Adam Roberts. Uh, yes, Adam Roberts. <laughs> 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 Renee Redzepi from uh -huh. Austria. You know, some of the, some of the people that I've met, it is really nice to have them. And of course I love that they're like, you know, thanks so much for hosting me. Oh, uh, that's so sweet. totally cool. It's yeah. true. And that's really but personal. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's like a personal address to you. I mean, I, I, th yes, I think yes. just the signature is almost, it. it's almost like baseball cards, you know, when you were a kid or something. It is. Yeah. But, you know, I was the head of modern literature at an auction house for a long time. And so I have to admit, I kind of got caught up in that. Like I would buy, if, for instance, you know, like John Updike would come to give a talk in San Francisco and I would buy a bunch of his older books, first editions of his older books, and I would take them to get signed mm. by him. Not to sell. I mean, I know that it gives them value, but I just wanted them for myself and it was really fun. And you feel like you're offending them if you ask them to just sign it because that does make it more valuable if it's not personalized. But oh. um, but I would always, I was too, I, I just didn't have the chutzpah to say, we just not sign it to anyone. So I would always say, can you sign it to me? But John Updike actually said, would you mind if I just inscribe the first one to you and the rest I just sign? And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I totally that. <laughs> Please, yeah, that's yeah, so really. interesting. I got, but, one, yeah. I, yeah, one of my favorite authors is John Lahr, who wrote the Tennessee Williams biography. Oh, sure, yeah. And he, he wrote a book about Joe Orton, the gay playwright from like London. Yeah, and I, yeah, it was one of my, ears. yeah, pick up your ears. And that was one of my favorite books. And I went to a New Yorker festival event to get him to sign it. And he wrote the most like obscure <gasps> thing inside of it. I can't remember oh, what he yeah. wrote. It was just like, it was like a riddle. It was like, the pictures, yeah, it was like, Adam, the pictures may have meaning, but da, da, da. I was like, 
I don't know what this oh means. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. um, well, the best actually, uh, so for me, what I love most are what's called an association copy. Mm -hmm. So it's from one person to another and both are well known for something or, or have an association with each other. Oh. So a lot, of, some of my collection is vintage, like, early lesbian literature okay. that is inscribed like Radcliffe Hall, The Well of Loneliness, inscribed to her lover. Ooh, um, okay. And, you know, and from John Radcliffe Hall, which was her sort of, the, her pen name that she used, or not her pen name, her name for herself. Um, so, you know, or with that partner's book plate in it. And so I have a bunch of those that are really cool. Or I have one by Vita Sackville West that's also signed by her husband Harold and things like on their on each of their poems so I love books that bring characters together from history mm -hmm. into one place at the same time well it and makes me think of like of, it makes me think of books as objects too because it's sort of like mm -hmm. as a collector it's sort of like they work on two levels you can read them and enjoy them but also it's yes like, it's like an artifact or like an Indiana Jones like thing that you get exactly out of Exactly. I've got a book from um, that uh, belonged to Elizabeth David, and mm. she inscribed it to Jeremiah Tower, the chef from. Oh Stone. wow! Yeah. Saying like in memory of the wonderful summer we spent together, and I was just like, "Yes, this is oh, so cool!" Oh, it's got and one from I have one from um, James Beard inscribed to MFK Fisher about wow. some that they spent together in Paris. So I mean, and those are all my personal collection, but those are you know it's so cool because it yeah. puts them together. And, oh, they were together at this time and and playing together and knew each other. And wow. It's cool. Well, I could talk to you about cookbooks all day, and maybe we'll get more into that. But we have come to the moment. <laughs> us to find out what you had for lunch today. All right. So I thought long and hard about what I wanted to have for lunch today. Okay. On my days off, there I have a favorite place to go, um, and it's over in the Richmond district, uh, and it's called Bun Mi, and it's just a really great Vietnamese sandwich place, and they have other Vietnamese dishes. So I got my favorite, the grilled pork Bun Mi that has uh, a pate, liver pate on it, and this delicious smoky grilled pork on it and mm. um and spicy jalapenos and cilantro and the works um and it's a perfect crunchy bread and it's just like such comfort food and homey and i absolutely love it well so that is what i had yeah there's a lot to work with there i mean <laughs> okay, we good. might need two hours now um well <laughs> but, but actually the first thing that i'm responding to is you know it's, it's just interesting the different people i've had on this show that i've had food people and then I've had comedians and writers and people who are not or directors who aren't necessarily in the food world and the right. way the way you just described the sandwich was so enthusiastic and so <laughs> specific so I guess my first question is how and when did this fascination with food happen and did it precede your fascination with books or was Ooh, books first or food first very good question yeah I think books first then food then cookbooks <laughs> so okay. um yeah, so I was really, really into books. In fact, ironically, this restaurant is just down the street from the first bookstore I ever kind of worked at, where I fell in love with the girl who worked behind the counter and then worked my way behind the counter, too. <laughs> she really taught me about, um, about used book selling and book scouting, which is like one of my favorite things in the world to do, um, just like hunting around for good used books. So that that was a delicious thing for me that I, that I have savored for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess when I, when I moved back to San Francisco after college, I, when I went to New York uh, for college, I got an internship at Christie's, the auction house. Okay. And really continued my love of, um, of rare things. I was in 19th century European paintings, but I was still collecting rare books, all these early signed Edward Gorey books that they would have at, at bookshops in New York. Just to rewind the clock for a second though, yeah. as, a, as a kid, were you a big reader? Um, yes, I okay. loved to, I loved to read, you know, um, uh, Harriet the Spy was one oh, of yeah. my favorites, of and, course, you know, yeah. all, all of those books from the 70s were, uh, and early 80s, but I was also like a tree climber, I was very much outside okay. all the time, um, always scraping myself up, running around the neighborhood. Interesting, so um, that kind yeah, of makes but sense. I was also yeah. really into digging in through people's stuff, like, hmm. It, the the block I grew up on, which was in San Francisco, had a lot of Victorian houses. And one 
feature of those is that there are doors usually on the stairs that go up to the house. There's a door under it that leads to where people keep their garbage cans. But you can go in and close the door and be private in there. And so okay. I would go around as a kid. I love to go into other people's and go through their their junk mail that they've thrown out but not opened and pretend it was to me. And oh, that's really <laughs> interesting. Okay. Yeah. So it was very interesting. And then I was an early dumpster diver before before homelessness was a, an issue here. I was always into dumpsters and digging through and finding, you know, of course I was a stamp collector. So I would find, you know, cool stamps on things, but I'd, I'd find all sorts of things and sort of make up stories about a pretend life. So that yeah. was, you know, so my interest in like book scouting and digging through other people's lives and experiences, I think has been the long time thing. Well, it makes me think about your relationship to objects, like Mm -hmm. things like it makes me wonder like when you were a little kid did you have like a drawer full of treasures or like oh did, yes yeah. <laughs> definitely <laughs> right yeah it's really interesting I don't know what that means yeah. I'm, I'm not I'm not advanced enough of a lunch therapist to know what the significance <laughs> of things are but but I do feel like yeah. possessions and like holding on to things is there it, it does reveal something psychologically maybe we can yes. explore what that is I don't so, know. and I'm from a family of collectors my uh -huh. parents are big collectors so I think that sort of came naturally to me but I was so into god I, I would dig through the um gutters I mean I sound just I sound like like a sewer rat but really I would go into the gutters of um uh, around the house like or you know like on on I grew up on Sacramento and Visadero Street so right at the corner I remember every time too it must have driven my parents crazy because I always did find like money or rings and things like that like, <laughs> I was always rewarded yeah. for, for this I never got like a, a rat that I pulled out I would like, like get a wedding ring or something really valuable <laughs> so it was always proved to be the correct thing but I didn't really get into food I think until my partner Paul and I got together in like 95 and or 93 We've been together 25 years so um wow. so we yeah a while since i was 25 oh my gosh and we just yeah a long time um but we both just slowly got into food it was really fun how we sort of discovered it together and i remember us really making fun of this cookbook that everybody had called sunday suppers at lucas oh yeah <laughs> well, I we love that, but... Calling it that yeah but we <laughs> thought it was hilarious <laughs> recipe had like one thing we had never heard of in it and we just thought it was so funny and then we found ourselves down in LA one weekend and someone said we should go to this restaurant Luke and we didn't <laughs> know what it was and so we found our way there and we we're like oh my god it's Lucas <laughs> you know, we've just been saying it wrong all this time and that was kind of an awakening for us we just fell in love with that food after having made fun of the cookbook of the way it was pronounced we, well it's, yeah it's and that, and, that yeah. and the recipes and so then we got into it and then we're like well let's go look at that cookbook actually and see if we can make any of this it was sad because they closed during the pandemic which is really really sad I mean, I Susan know. Goyen, who is the chef there, she, I think she's one of those, I feel like LA has its secret um, group of chefs that like, don't like mm -hmm. really break through the like East Coast media. Like you don't see them on the cover yeah. of magazines and stuff, but it's like Nancy, I mean, Nancy Silverton's pretty famous, but, but I just feel like, like LA kind of keeps its chefs kind of within its it own definitely. borders. Yeah. Yes. Those guys from Animal. Oh yeah. John and Vinny. They, yeah. Like yeah. you never hear of them outside of it. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, this is a strange question, but it's, but I had, I, I did take a psychology class once and my, oh, all right. <laughs> and my, te my teacher, well, so I accidentally went to law school. That's a whole other story. And uh, <laughs> when, so many people I know accidentally went to law school. Yeah. And yeah. when I was there, this teacher, uh, I think her name was Martha Duncan, I think wrote a book called Beloved, Pri Beloved Prisons, Romantic Outlaws. And a lot of her book had to do with like people actually wanting to go to prison, like repeat offenders who go to prison. Oh, yes. But it had, but it also had to do with like gunk and like slime and like people's <laughs> fascination with like, wow. you know, like like the way kids play with like you know slime goo. and make it goo. Yeah. And for some reason, I don't know why, when you were talking about being in the gutters and like pulling out things, <laughs> and then I was thinking yeah. about like cooking. Like, do you see a connection between like getting your uh -huh. hands? 
in a bowl of like meatloaf and like mixing the meat together and like the gutter <laughs> and pulling it, out. Yes, the I guess I do. I mean, especially like mud. I used to love when I was growing up. We had a farm up in Healdsburg in the wine country, and it, but it was it was not vineyards. It was actual farm and I loved walking around barefoot all year round there and you know squeaking through the mud and digging through things and yeah finding insects go is yes so that makes total sense yeah and it's really interesting to think about <laughs> your relationship to cookbooks because it is kind of the perfect thing for you because because of your love for um touching things and like being because mm -hmm. it's like a book that's about actual like actions and doing stuff I don't know it's like yeah. It's yes. as opposed to like a book work of literature, which is more in the head as yeah. opposed to like- an, an yeah. No, it's thing. not as actionable. The only thing that really comes up against that theory yeah. is um, my love for animals. And okay. I, mean, I always remember, because I, I really love eating meat, but I love animals. And I'll never forget when I was like 10, I went to a animal rights, no, I must've been like 13 or 14 because I went by myself, but to an animal rights uh, rally up at Davis, UC Davis. And I remember sitting in the back of the bus, eating my roast beef sandwich. <laughs> Wait, you ate a roast beef sandwich on the way to an yeah. animal rights I know, rally? I know. That's how much I liked my roast beef sandwiches that I, I was the, one of those people that had to have like the same sandwich for a whole year. Every, uh -huh. every it was a little OCD, but anyway, um, I really, uh, so while I love getting my hands in there and everything, uh, I've never killed an animal. I've mm -hmm. never had to go through heavy duty butchery. And, um, uh, you know, we, we on the pet store, we were dog walkers for 10 years. And so mm -hmm. that, that's the only little bit of a dichotomy there. Right. Yeah. That... But I love meat. I can't help it. So I, I do eat it, but I'm, I'm one of those, one of those annoying people that's like, I can't watch it die. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I feel like you're in the center of mindfulness in terms of like people being conscientious mm -hmm. about everything from like composting. to like, you know, yes, true. What, what the, you know, so do you find like living in San Francisco that sometimes it can be overwhelming, like deciding whether to get like organic, local? The, the, totally. The, you know, yeah. Totally. I mean, luckily there are enough stores like Buy Right, which is wonderful, that you won't, you don't even have to choose between them. They, right. everything in there is well chosen. If it's not organic, then they chose it because it's close by or they have a good reason mm -hmm. for it. You can really trust the fish monger, which is, that's a really rare thing. Usually you don't know where your fish is coming from and they're very trustworthy. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty solid on, especially my meats uh, and fish right. going from organic places. Although I feel like because the taste is better, really. I agree, but it's so interesting what's happening right now because in LA, Bel Campo meets, which oh my God. was so expensive. Terrible. Yeah. Oh. And that's like that was they were getting it off the truck that like sells it to the mass market supermarket. So it's like, how do you know who to trust? I don't even see how they can reopen. I mean, oh, yeah. really. I, I read that and I was like, no, that, that trust is gone because the trust, like what I was saying about the fish hunger, yeah, that trust is so it's like the trust in a marriage, you know, if, yeah. if you break that. To build that back up is going to take a long, long time. But it also and happened at the, I, I just, um, yeah, uh, at the Willows Inn on Lummi Island in Washington State. There was that big right. ex expose that he was like serving. And yeah. I went there with Craig, but he was like, and we thought it was the most incredible food we'd ever had. But it was like oh, the we're chickens were coming from Costco and the scallops oh were God. being cut I love down. the guy in that article who said um, it's not even like, physically possible to feed that many people from the food on our island in a yeah, week. Yeah. It's like two days worth, you know, so right. do the math. <laughs> like, oh yeah. Um, but, all right. Well, we have to steer this back to you and okay. your story. Okay. But so I feel like we left something out because you talked about your childhood. You talked about collecting things. You talked about having a girl you had a crush on starting in the book industry. Yes. These, and then I think we missed the beat where you got into cookbooks. Oh, well, um, hmm. I, when I was working, so then after I graduated from college, I moved back to San Francisco and got a job at an auction house out here that was all rare books. And I became one of two specialists there. We wrote all the catalogs and did all the, all the research and descriptions. 
And I was the head of modern lit, but also you became a specialist in whatever came through. So you'd never know this about me, but I am the like rare golf book specialist. (laughs) Or at least I was for a number of years. Wow. I had no idea. Yes. You would get one good collection or one so-so collection, sell it, do well with it. And you'd start getting better and better collections. And whichever one of us had had time to catalog that original group became the expert in it so i became an expert in that in angling books <laughs> and you know all sorts of weird things but the books on food were the ones that were the most interesting to me and mm-hmm. particularly i mean i love the cookbooks but particularly the ones that said something about the culture of the place mm. so i love like the um colonial indian cookbooks that are so interesting because you know half of them are tell you to to avoid anything, anything that was like created there. You don't want to, you know, don't trust the servants. You should just give them extra money when they go to the market because they're going to steal from you anyway. Just terrible yeah. stuff. Yeah. But then half of them embrace the culture and embrace the food and want you to try things and are respectful of the uh, native cooks from those places. So mm. it's really interesting to, to see that. And then I really loved the books that were about, and still have collection of these, of um, books that are about how to open your own retail store, mm. uh, which was interesting to me anyway, because, you know, I went on to open the pet store. So I really mm-hmm. love retail in general and that psychology but there's a whole series that used to be published that they they don't do this anymore on like how to um a great butcher shop one I had how to set up your butcher shop um with your glass cases and it's Mm -hmm. so English it's like um sheep's head sheep's stomach (laughs) sheep's heart fern and pot fern and pot (laughs) (laughs) you know or there's one called um roadside marketing and it's all about it was from 1920s all about now that cars are in existence they can come all the way out to your farm to buy from you they don't have to buy in the city Mm -hmm. and so this is how you set up your roadside stand if you're in a dip in the road do it like this if you're on a hill do it like this and this is how to talk to your uh customers if they complain this is what you should say you know i mean I just love that. I love the idea. And I have books about sign writing Mm -hmm. and, you know, that whole thing just fascinated me. And I found that the most books on those subjects were in the food area. And it just sort of led me into the cookbook arena. And it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, it's like an interesting way, like an angle on history. It's like, instead of like having to sit there reading a dusty, boring history book. It's like you're actually yeah. reading something kind of fun and unexpected that, that has history within it, you know? That's right. It, yeah. is right. it brings it alive in this way yeah. that you weren't expecting because it mm-hmm. does tell you about the people and their culture, wherever it is. Um, yeah. There's a really cool one I got recently that I was going to sell. And then I was like, I have to keep this. And it was from Nigeria from like 19... 19- 56 I think and it was the first cookbook published by a Nigerian woman Mm -hmm. for young women there Um, she also taught cooking there but she had learned and she grew up there but she had also gone to school in England and came back and you know she's saying now girls I know that you're thinking that it's silly to use measurements because your aunts and grandmothers all don't use that Mm -hmm. but you're forgetting what you don't realize is that they had many many mistakes and uh many dishes were thrown out and much food wasted because they had to learn how much and this is you know i'm going to teach you how to use measurements Mm. and all the measurements were in cigarette tins And, (laughs) and then there's sections on like if you're if you're in the countryside, this is how you make a stove. You know, if you're in the city, you have a stove. If you're in the countryside, you know, put two kerosene cans, you know, like so, and then you put a board over it. And this whole thing on sort of making your own fire and in the countryside and how to cook on it. And, you know, it's just telling me so much about the countryside, about the city, about the difference. What was that book called? Um, it's called Miss Williams's Cookbook. Oh, wow. I love that. That's a great yeah, title. Yeah. It's funny. My, when my when I got into cooking, my mom, and I, don't, I don't know if she still has this, but like her father, when she got married in like 1970 something, her father's like co-workers, wives, like yeah. put, on, put on like recipe cards, recipes for her to make. So she's, I mean, oh, just, that's great. yeah, but it's interesting to see that stuff. It. And, you know, it's all like, 
you know, margarine and like sweet and yes. saccharine. Yeah, um, totally. Well, I have to ask, okay, so I'm a huge cookbook fan, a huge cookbook, cookbook collector. And this is yes. nothing, this has nothing to do with your psychology at all. But okay. I, I must ask you like, <laughs> Sorry, what, yeah. what are the, um, what are the most valuable cookbooks out there? Like, what are the ones that like are the Holy grail? Like if you found it in a, in a a state sale, you'd be like, Oh my God, I found it. What what would that be? Well, I just bought one of them as my, my pandemic present to myself, which was the first edition of a Renaissance cookbook. That was the first, the first book to picture a fork and the first cookbook to actually have illustrations in it. So what's it called? It's, um, oh God, it's a long title, but it's by uh, Bartolom- Bartolomeo Scappi, S-C-A-P-P-I, and okay. it's Renaissance Italy, 1570, um, and it's just got these wonderful illustrations of cooking over fire, of knives, wow. forks, and it's it's a really cool one. You're not going to find it probably in a used bookstore, but, yeah. but it was really, it was probably like... Uh, I think I paid fifty one hundred for it, and that was actually really fair. And is I it saw, is it the original like paper and the original? I mean, it's no, all yeah. It like- yeah, and it's an early binding. It's probably so most books pre nineteen hundred came disbound or in in you know paperback that you would take to your binder and have them rebound. So um, all those bindings, you're not going to find an original binding, but it's um, probably from the seventeen hundred. So it's a pretty early okay. binding. So do you put gloves on when you look at it or do you, yeah. do you just tear it open? <laughs> I mean, okay. part, of, part of the whole thing in my store, I feel like as a young collector, I was so turned off to going into fine and rare bookstores because they were so snooty about it. And they mm-hmm. always had the, you know, the better books behind the counter and they you know, would sort of give me the stink eye if I wanted to look at stuff. It wasn't until I started piling up books to buy that they were like, oh, okay, I guess, <laughs> no, she's okay. But it was so annoying. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to trust my customers to not throw the book across the mm-hmm. room when they get in. Yeah. And I want to be the gateway drug for collectors. Like it's sort of like opera, like the, the fans are dying at and we need new collectors and young collectors well you and know what I, Chris, open yeah. up. I, and let people touch it well it's interesting at christmas a couple of christmases ago craig called you and mm-hmm. said would you put together some books for adam for christmas or hanukkah as i celebrate but yes. it's usually christmas because it's with his family and you <laughs> sent some really rare and interesting books which i have on my shelf but i don't want to oh, get up great. but there was like one one <laughs> was called like um it. punches it was like punch yes and that was really cool it's like That's really cool. old like and then there's and there's an amazing one that you sent that was toasts it's like famous like toasts yes, the people but yes. like that that felt very rare and like you know and do you remember like what that was yeah or, oh yeah of course I mean I, I loved putting that together for you because I loved so getting it yeah. go around and think about what you were gonna like and what yeah was cool on the shelf and, but you know as as rare as certain books are like that or some of the really early African-American cookbooks or Southern cookbooks are really hard to find, oftentimes because of weather or because of earthquakes. There's a a San Francisco one that was very rare because a lot of the copies got destroyed in the earthquake. Um, There are so many more that are not that rare that Mm -hmm. you don't have to wear gloves for that I do trust that you're going to pick up at my store and love and Mm -hmm. you know and that's what I want people to I mean great if you want to collect you know and have the first book ever written about olives from the 1500s (laughs) I will find that for you I actually did find that for someone once I will find it for you but I also want people to be able to just have a shelf of them and not be afraid that, you know, that they shouldn't have it or shouldn't touch it. That's well, I remember at your story when I, when I came into your story, which by the way, I should say, and I'll say this in the intro, it's one of the most beautiful cookbook yeah. stores in the yeah. country or the world. Um, but I remember I got a book there. I think it was from your store. Maybe it was now I'm like going to be embarrassed, but I think it yeah. was, it, it must've been from your store because it was like a gay Jewish like cookbook for like the community like during the AIDS crisis it was like oh yes Mm -hmm. yeah it was like so specific yeah yeah it was for um a temple just down the street from here um and I love that I love that book because it's so like I feel so connected to it obviously Mm -hmm. because I'm gay and Jewish but also because it's so specific to its time and its place and um anyway we can go on and on but we have to go back (laughs) to your sandwich so okay (laughs) (laughs) You, okay, so now the other part of all this was like the um 
San Francisco of it all. Like mm -hmm. it seemed as you were, cause like, I try to listen when someone's describing their lunch, like that's my moment to really like key in. Uh -huh. And you talked about yes. the, the district in San Francisco where it was, the, which was the Richmond. Richmond district. So I guess your sense of place um, like live, you say you grew up in San Francisco. So can you yeah. talk a little, maybe talk a little bit about being tied to where you are and, and how long, and yeah. have, you, have you lived there your whole life or have you? I, pretty much. Yeah. Except for those four years at Sarah Lawrence. Uh, <laughs> I've, been, oh, yeah. I've been here. So since 1969 wow. and you know, it has changed a lot, uh, but there are also parts of it that are so much still, similar to what I remember as a kid, and especially those neighborhoods where minorities live and, and have lived and still live. Um, the Richmond is one of them that's largely Asian neighborhood, though it also used to have a lot of more Russians, but it still does have a bunch of Russians, but especially when I was growing up, it was people who had gotten out of the Bolshevik revolution and with their jewels intact and mm -hmm. came here. Um, so, but that area is just wonderful and it's evolved over time as but still is an all asian neighborhood it's just got more modern restaurants um mm -hmm. along it and same with chinatown which i absolutely adore and the mission you know i love walking down mission street which is one block off of valencia which has gotten very popular valencia was like lesbian neighborhood you <laughs> I trip over someone with a rain stick on the way. <laughs> you wear your like lesbian Guatemalan pants, the whole thing <laughs> in the hot tub place called the Cento. And um, there was a, a women's bookstore with wise woman books there. Okay. And, you know, it was a very different feeling than it is now, where it's very popular shopping street now. But um, Mission Street, one block away, has really not changed very much. And I mean, there are a few. Um, sort of gentrified spots along it but not not much um you still get the the stores with like the half mannequins with the with pants on and i mean it's just so fun and i that those are the places that i feel the most at home walking down the street because it just you know reminds me like la taqueria which i think i argue always is the best taqueria in the city is on mission in 25th and the first time i went there was with my sixth grade spanish class oh wow okay I've been, it's been a while yeah i know <laughs> i've been ordering the same and the same people work there and own it and i've been ordering like the same order since then and what is it what's your order um a uh carne asada a taco with carne asada cheese and a small melon, which is the uh, cantaloupe drink and mm. uh, cheese quesadilla to go with it. That sounds delicious. So good. <laughs> so I think, I think what's occurring to me is like, you know, when people flee the city that they're from, it's usually to get away from their families or like the culture they grew up in. That was the and only I'm, downside to staying here. Well, I was going to ask you, like, did you have a good relationship with your family growing up? And I mean, and, <laughs> yeah, okay. That <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as a teenager, I could not wait to get away. I really was was um scratching to get out. I was I had had a miserable time at um my school that I had had to go to after my elementary school um ended. So my junior high school was this place called Marine Country Day School. By the time I entered, I was like obviously a lesbian, but really bad at sports. So I had nothing going for me. <laughs> oh, no. wow, that, that's a double bind. Yeah. I, it was a double bind. Nobody yeah. did, like it. That's like being a gay be boy being, yeah, you, being you, bad you, at drama club or something. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it, was, it was horrible. And then I came out in high school and um, I was sort of having an affair with a woman that I worked with at Cole Hardware. <laughs> Oh like, such a scary thing. <laughs> but, but um my parents were really pissed about it and they you know so we fought all the time oh i'm sorry really, yeah. it's okay i mean they you know it was part a big part of the fighting was that all of their friends had been gay and almost all of them died during oh. the crisis which was horrible i mean at least at least a dozen if not more of their very close friends and so the irony of them being unhappy with my coming out just made it so much more angering and and upsetting i've never heard that story like i've never heard that dynamic before like most yeah. of my friends who struggle like, with their parents when they come out it's like religious reasons or yeah no no republican were, thing you know and these were all guys that i grew up with like every right. single day coming home and they were at the house so it didn't you know well we don't want it to be hard for you honey you know they were from the south and they're just i mean 
they weren't going to not accept it, but they just wanted to sort of, I think, put it off for a while. Right. They just weren't ready for me to be, I was 16 and she was 28 and they just like, okay. they just didn't want to deal with the adult nature of it, I think. And what brought your parents uh, to San Francisco in the first place? Um, Being from Jacksonville, Florida, oh, they yeah. just, they just really wanted to get away. Yeah. Apparently they caused a scandal by leaving, but luckily they left. They got here the year before I was born. So I have to thank them for that, but they're still here. And um, they oh, great. Just, but when I was in college, but they, so they live like there, it's actually very sweet. So we're, we're close now and they live about five blocks away from each other. And my mother remarried. And so my mom turned 80 last weekend and her husband oh, wow. is 88 and my dad is 86. And they all like, they take each other to their colonoscopies <laughs> together. <laughs> they go, they travel together. They go to the opera together. They're like, I keep saying they're like lesbians. It's really cute. They learned they, from they just, you, yeah. Yeah, really. <laughs> they just all hang out together, and it's really, really nice. So, and it's a great. So then my sister moved back here from New York, and she and her husband have a son, and I love that he gets to see this sort of alternative family of yeah. the, um, all all together and friends and you know it's just such a good it's sort of ir ironic that, that they were so disapproving of you and now they're in a throuple i know, I know totally <laughs> <laughs> it's so true <laughs> it's so true yeah, um, <laughs> but they accepted me long ago I, like it, yeah. it worked itself out um especially once i got through college and they then they, they also really didn't like this woman that I was with. And so yeah. once I got together with someone who was a little more stable, they were happy. And then now with Paula, my wife there, yeah. you know, I love her and she's part of the family. Well, it's so. very poignant. Like it's interesting because my, my parents, I mean, I'm, I'm a little younger than you, but not much. I mean, I'm, I was born in 1979. So you know, a lot of my childhood was like people dying of AIDS and just yeah. the red ribbons at the Oscars and all that stuff. Right. So, so when I came out, it was a similar fear of, AIDS. I mean, that was just the mm, hugest part. So, and I feel like the new generation that's coming out now, it's like they don't have that sense of like, this is a death sentence. And like, this that's is right. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of think that's why San Francisco got through this pandemic so well, mm -hmm. because we had not only the same experience with a with a deadly pandemic, but the same doctor and scientist, Dr. Fauci, advising us. And so, you know, oh. we were able to go, okay, you know, remember last time we didn't take it seriously. We thought that they were just against the bathhouses and wanted to close down because they were anti-gay and we were wrong. There, there really was a deadly pandemic that, you know, that we needed to protect ourselves from and we didn't and we lost uh, so many people and we're not going to let that happen again. So people were super careful here. I never in the entire year had a single person try to come in without a mask in my store. I mean, mm -hmm. not, not once. And Did you stay open the whole time? We, we had to be closed for just two months. Okay. So, um, but I mean, you know, people here were very, people still haven't, I mean, I'll go out at midnight to walk my dog and people are still wearing their masks outside. <laughs> like, okay, yeah. no, we can, we can, we can take those off now. Same but, here in LA. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious to just add as a sidebar, um, yeah. I, I, I was just thinking about cookbooks that were written by gay men who died of AIDS because I know that there was Richard Sachs. Was that? Was he yeah, like Richard Sachs. He was pastry guy, and yeah. people I talked to loved him. I think Flo Breaker knew him, and yeah, you know, people who I've talked to really, really loved him a lot. And same with Felipe Rojas, um, who was a Peruvian um, and a guy who was gay, and he wrote a lot about South American cookery, and he died mm -hmm. also. Did you read that article in about Zuni Cafe? That was great. Oh yeah, by John Birdsall. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. I was, I talked to the sous chef, or not sous chef, the chef from there, Nate. Um, it shops with us a lot and I was at, so he came in the other day and we were talking about it and he said he really didn't know any of that stuff about mm -hmm. him. And he said, it's like, I now that rock has turned over and I just want to explore and figure out more about mm -hmm. him. Um, so yeah. that was really interesting. And I didn't, I didn't know any of that history. So this is a sidebar on a sidebar, but okay. did you see the movie? Can you ever forgive me? Oh yeah. I love that movie. I love it. We, too, but I, we just saw it a second time. Oh yeah. Cause I was thinking about you cause it's about like, yeah, I mean, it's about forging like class, you know, yes. book, book collectors, lesbians, yes. you know, and that whole era. So, okay. so I, had to, <laughs> I had to put that out there. Okay. We have to go back to the, we're going to return to your childhood just for a moment because we left something out, which is pretty important, which is what, what kind of food did you eat growing up and what kind of 
par- cooks were your parents? Very health food oriented for my mother. She was really into a lot of vulgar wheat and <laughs> um, <laughs> bran. And um, she, yeah, she, it was very healthy. I didn't, you know, I didn't love it, but she also was a very good cook and she could, mix things in like you know dirty rice which actually had liver in it she would trick mm-hmm. us into eating things or or there was a fish stew i always hated fish stew but she called it the swamp so mm-hmm. then of course i loved it I well, the liver, it. you had you had liver on your sandwich today so it worked yes that's right it yeah. did work the okay. only thing i wouldn't eat of course was anything shaped like an animal like she'd make a really cute pancake in the shape of a bunny and i would start crying which just probably <laughs> made her so pissed off and i totally don't blame her um I and there you were all those too. years later eating roast beef on your yeah, exactly. animal rights rally so <laughs> yeah, but you wouldn't eat the bunny well, pancake like I said, as long as it doesn't have a face I'm okay, <laughs> uh, okay. So do you not but, eat wait will you not eat like a um like lamb head or whatever the chefs do like pigs oh no head. i probably would yeah, yeah. Probably yeah. Would. I'm, a, I'm enough of a gourmet that i couldn't pass it out when i when i was working for serious eats it was right when they opened it was like right when they started their website and they had yeah. an event at adam perry lang's like barbecue Ooh, place in new york wow. and they got a whole pig and we all put rubber gloves on and it, it, it was like a whole smoked pig oh with his face staring at us. And then you just like reached in and grabbed a hunk of meat and it was disturbing, but delicious. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I did. I was oddly enough in Palau um, uh, several years ago, which is near the Philippines. And we were at the inauguration of the president. It's a very long story, but there was a whole roast pig there and yeah. like that. It was just, yeah, you didn't have to dig into it, but it, the face was there and it was, it was pretty intense. So you mentioned earlier a little bit, you just kind of quickly glossed past it, but like being a little OCD about. Yes. And also I was just going to say about my dad, oh. you were asking about what kind of food my parents made. My dad was, um, there are like certain things that I just can't eat today because they remind me of the things that he would make because he was so bad at it and still (laughs) still is and he's so the funny thing is he loves a good meal but he has a hard time distinguishing like he'll have a chocolate cake at at you know zims which is an old you know i I don't even know how to like an old diner and say Mm -hmm. to clear out the best chocolate cake (laughs) he's ever had and then he'll go to restaurant danielle the next night in new york and he'll declare that the best chocolate cake he's ever had he doesn't like so um he would make us corned beef hash from a can or brisket that was just like leather dry and horrible and those are like the two main things i remember he would fall back on to make are your parents jewish yes okay oh i'm jewish yeah you're jewish yeah that all felt very jewish to me like the yes yeah yeah, and even the restaurant of it all like loving like the deli like chocolate cake like yeah my my parents like my parents go to these restaurants where it's like, you know, like Italian American food and they think it's like the best pasta. And then I'll take them to like something I read about and like Bon Appetit or like, yeah. times. So like, oh, that was terrible. Like, oh, God. yeah. So well, like, perfect. like, like all that, like, you know, like authentic Italian, I mean, authentic, but like, you know, pasta made by hand to them. Yeah, it's not as delicious as like, you know, <laughs> penne alla vodka. Right, know. right, right. Yeah. yeah, I think the food he grew up with sort of in, you know, in the Depression era and wartime in in Florida uh, was not memorable, even though his mother grew up in Cuba and it should have been really interesting food. It was not. And mm. so he's, you know, he's still is like just as happy with, you know, salmon from a can as he would be from like a wild caught salmon. So when, when did your awakening happen in terms of like, when did you first like cook something or eat something where you're like, ah, there's a whole other world out there? I, well, actually, my first cookbook that I had was the one by Evan Kleiman about mm. uh, pasta, okay. uh, pasta rustica. And I thought that I was really good at making it when I first moved back home after college and I had my first little apartment. And, you know, I realized now it was just awful. I mean, I would overcook <laughs> this fettuccine and cut up bacon and just like throw it in. <laughs> so, uh, but but um and probably button mushrooms but i uh it was an awakening nonetheless and um that really got me started on on being interested in cooking and exploring it and, and when you mentioned uh, I, I, I just tried to bring it up yes. earlier but okay, sorry. The, the, the OCD. well the ocd because you said i just remember what you said but you said that like you would eat the same roast beef sandwich every day 
Yes. So what, what was that about? And like, where did that begin? And when did that end? It started really young. I would have like peanut butter and jelly sandwich every single day for lunch. And then, you know, the next year it was cream cheese and jelly. And maybe the next year after that, it was honey and peanut butter. But it was always like, I just needed, I don't know, somehow, I think I really needed the consistency mm-hmm. of that. I didn't have a lot of, um, I didn't have as much consistency of home as, as I probably should have. It's so hard to to remember, but one of the most important moments for me ever in an early therapy session I had was in talking about how independent I was as a kid, how I would go under these houses and, and go through the mail or climb trees around the neighborhood, or I'd crawl under people's houses and mm-hmm. listen to their conversation. Like I was totally into that. And I, I you, oh, and I also, I had all these, there were all these shopkeepers around the neighborhood that I would check in with that I considered myself friends with, but also I think were kind of keeping an eye on me. Mm-hmm. Um, there was the, the corner store London market where I would get my bazooka gum and Joe was always there. And then there was another store on, on California, a couple more. And, you know, I just would stop there on my route every day on my bike. And, um, I described to my therapist how I was so independent and she said, did you, did it ever occur to you that maybe you were independent because you had to be? Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, <laughs> no, yeah. it didn't. I always thought that I was independent because I was sort of proud of myself and, and, you know, and I was just an independent person, but I think I kind of, I kind of wasn't able to depend on a lot of consistency at home. Mm-hmm. Um, so. I well, think- it makes me think of those objects we were talking about earlier and like, this idea of like creating your own little world where you could be in charge, like, mm-hmm. and, and then it kind of, yeah. trans- and it translates nicely to the bookstore. Cause it's like, yes, now you, now you totally. have your own world filled with objects that you curate and it's yeah. your, your space and you can yeah. let in who you want to. And like, if somebody's mm-hmm. coming in that you don't want, you know, it's like, that's right. <laughs> create, you created your own world for yourself. So it's, it's yeah. kind of a beautiful continuation yeah. of the same idea. And it's really fun. I have to say to share it with other people, like the, my collection here, I have a whole library filled with books. And for years, no one was interest, interested in it. I mean, my partner isn't really into it. The, um, I mean, you know, she's into it if I, if I describe something to her, but she, she would never like ask on her own what something is. My friends weren't interested. And then one day this, I ran into a woman who was a customer of ours at the pet shop at the antiquarian book fair and it turned out that she was writing a book about a book thief it was a a true story it was really fun and she wanted to interview collectors of that were unusual and so uh, women they're not that many women collectors especially I think at the time I was like 30 so she asked if she could interview me and I said sure so she came over and she freaked out over my library and just loved it and I thought if I could have this all the time in my life, I would be so happy. And so I feel like what I've created is that because mm-hmm. I, I, these people are coming to me who have this passion and I can share it with them. And the way I've curated stuff, it's like a, a you know, a spider web. They go in and they get caught and they're totally, oh, totally. Yeah. And it makes me so happy because, and, and, you know, we show each other this mutual respect of loving the books and mm-hmm. it's just so fun for me to see them get a kick out of it. And I'm kind of a temporary collector now where I can have these books for a little while and enjoy them. I catalog them, I put them on my website and then I'll see them go either at the store or I'll put them on, on Twitter or Instagram and people respond to them and buy them. And it's just like, oh my God, you know, or, or they'll say, like, I just had off the Mickey Mouse cookbook from 1975. Oh, yeah, I think I saw uh, that on your Instagram. So many people wrote in like, oh, I used to make this from that. Oh, that was my first cookbook. And, you know, I just, oh, it makes me so happy to, to share that with people. Oh, well, that's a lovely note to end your therapy session on. Thank you. Because <laughs> I, I think it's like, I do feel like we came full circle because I feel at the beginning, you know, with this idea of like you, you as a child and like crawling through the mud and get, I was trying to like connect the, <laughs> connect the dots, but I do feel like it all is of a piece. But now yeah. I'm going to use these final moments to ask you tons of questions about cookbooks. Okay. So you've <laughs> given me so much to think about now. I'm oh, good. I mean, I don't, char- I don't even charge anything. But, <laughs> I know, it's great. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to ask, okay, so first, like, because all these questions have been occurring to me as we've been talking. Sure. So, and this is like one of those cheesy questions, but if the store, God forbid, 
was on fire. Oh I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say that. I know. I know. I don't mean to trigger your fears, but what books would you grab first? Oh God. Um, you know, that's so funny. I have thought about it with my house before, yeah. but I've never thought about it with the store. Or your house. I mean, you could do your house too, if you want. The house, um, it would be the, there's this rare Southern cookbook, but it was the second cookbook ever written by an African-American woman in the United States. It's called What's, What Mrs. Fisher Knows About Old Southern Cooking. Oh, I love that. And she was, I'll, I'll tell you briefly the story because it is really cool. She moved from the South with her husband after slavery. She had been enslaved, um, came to San Francisco with their children, one of whom she had along the way, and started a pickling and preserving business. She won a bunch of awards for her pickles and preserves and wrote this cookbook. It came out in like 1881. It was published over in Oakland. And she didn't, she was illiterate, but she had somebody else help her write it. And uh, a lot of copies were lost in the earthquake. So there aren't very many. And I managed to find myself a copy. Wow. It was $4,000 then, but now it sells for like 10,000 online. It's, or I mean, on, at auction. It's very hard to find. And I've always loved it. And for a long time until I got this copy last week, it was my most valuable cookbook. And recently, uh, like a couple of years ago, the census records for um, African Americans living in San Francisco came online, or for all of San Francisco came online, and you could find out where a lot of people lived. I found out she lived a block from my store. Mm. And my store was a butcher shop at the turn of the century. And so that means she had to have shopped there. That's so cool. And I know. And I was like, why was I drawn to that book mm -hmm. and, you know, and pay that much for it? And then it turns out that like she had for sure a connection to the space that I'm in now. And, and it's beautiful know, it's that it's in your really hands cool. too. It's like, I can imagine a book like that just being in some like very rich person's house. Like, oh, that's, what uh, I've been, you know, this means nothing <laughs> to me. But for you, it's like you appreciate it so much and get so much love it. pleasure love out it. of it. Yeah. All right. What are the other two? Come on. Oh, um, okay. So let's see. Um, oh, a, my signed copy of Cannery Row by Steinbeck. Oh, okay. that's not a cookbook though. Should I be saying just cookbooks? I mean, it's interesting, but no, I think you have to do cookbooks. Okay. Um, the same here. Oh, God. Are we doing, are we doing your house or are we doing the store now? I, no. I okay. That. I guess we should go back to the store. Um, mm, mm, I have some really behind the counter. Well, I, okay. I have one that I just sold, but I haven't sent to her yet that Tony Tipton Martin just bought. It's the second ever cocktail book written by an African-American. Okay. Uh, and extremely rare because it was published in Montana. He was a, um, a bartender at a, at a saloon in Montana. And it only went through, it went through three printings, but each one was just a paperback. This one's signed by him on the cover and super, super rare. So that I'd have to say is because yes. there's only one copy known in the whole country and it's at the Montana Historical Society. So I would definitely have to grab that one. Yes, you do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then the last one, there's a really cool old Mexican cookbook that okay. is about cooking in Puebla um, that from the 1800s that I think is a really, really special book. Well, what's interesting about your answer to this question, now we can actually bring it back to psychology for a second, okay. which is that... <laughs> I noticed that like your, the books that you saved were almost out of a sense of duty and like preservation. Mm, they weren't yeah. necessarily like personal to you, although the first one was personal to you because of the connection to it. But yeah, that, that's, that's almost like you, you see yourself almost like the like, you know, like caretaker. Sort of like, yeah, caretaker right. of, of right. these, these stories. I um, feel yeah. that way. I mean, that's so funny that you say that because sometimes people will come in and pick a book off the shelf that um, has been there for like seven years or something to buy it. And I always say to them, you know, this book has been waiting for you a really long time. Mm, I so, love that. yeah. So I feel very much like I'm the, the caretaker for a while. And then these are oh. going to go to their proper homes. It's sort of like, you know, a collector gets all their stuff together. It's like making a dandelion and then I'm there to blow on it and see them receive themselves at all these different libraries and homes. That's so nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I guess as a final question, because we we ate up our time so quickly, yeah, I know. although I, I could keep you here forever. Yeah. Um, what are some books 
this is a different, like, yeah, I'm approaching this differently now that like are actually readily available, but that most people don't know about, like, what are some cookbooks that like, aren't like your, oh, you know, okay, mastering I'll tell you, the art of French cooking or something, you know? Yeah. There's a fabulous, um, a publisher called interlink and they publish all these great cookbooks that are a lot of Middle Eastern and Georgian and uh, like from places that you just would not expect at all. Um, I really, really love those books because, and I feel like a lot of people don't know about them. They did a great Afghanistani one last year called Parwana. Mm -hmm. They, um, they just came out with an Egyptian one. Um, they're, they're just really, really interesting. They have an Iraqi cookbook, a, a couple Syrian ones called the Aleppo cookbook. And I, I just love that they oh in Ethiopia a great mm -hmm. Ethiopian cookbook so so they've really paid attention for a much longer than the rest of the cookbook world has in uh on cultures that we are just so not that familiar with that's I really cool yeah. yeah my favorite title from them is called Mune and it's this huge book of Lebanese preserving the entire book it's like a 45 dollar tome all about pickling and preserving Lebanese cuisine. I mean, it's just, I, I love that attention. And people can go to your website and, and order yes, it? Yes, yeah, okay. it's all on there. Yeah. Okay, I have a controversial question to ask you that okay. could open a whole can of worms. <laughs> all right. I, I, I feel like your game, um, even though we're at the end, but I just have to ask this. So okay. what, what is, as a bookseller, what is your attitude about selling books by, I'm going to quote unquote, like bad chefs or like people who now have been brought exposed as you know I mean the first one that comes to mind is Mario Batali yeah yeah but like luckily I never really sold many of those anyway like I don't sell any of the food network I did have his and I couldn't even sell them off at my half off sale at the <laughs> end of the year so I okay. ended up just donating them to the library but yeah I try to not I mean there's certain ones you know we were we were referencing Alison Roman earlier and I have oh, to I say, mean I never said it you, no I mean, no I know but I have to say <laughs> she's you know I I stand behind her I know her pretty well we've we've gotten to know each other over the years um, with her coming to give talks I really like her I consider her a friend and her books are wonderful the cookbooks yeah. I mean the 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 recipes in there they work really well I don't feel like she's a thief I certainly think she misspoke and regretted it and tried to apologize and and I I just have a feeling she put her foot in her mouth and didn't yeah. You know, didn't mean to lump two um, Asian American women together in what she was trying to say. And, and you know, I, I don't know who is well known who can say that they haven't done something like that, that mm -hmm. they've regretted. I, in sure. fact, I once made fun of Marta Batali's children on Twitter and with John Birdsall and, <laughs> and he <laughs> saw, he yeah. saw it. And that was like, oh, I just wanted to kill myself. I'm like yeah. now I don't care, but sure. uh, I, <laughs> I I've, like, I've gone through that. that. Yeah. <laughs> I've, been, I've got my, my feet in hot water as you know, yeah. when I, when I did the piglet. Like, okay, yeah. thank God. <laughs> you know, I don't have to care anymore. Yeah. But, um, but you know, I mean, so we've all done stuff like that, but for I never carried Paula Dean um, uh -huh. books. I don't care any Rachel. Ray. I, I I like books that are they can be simple and easy, but they can't be dumbed down, and they can't be just like written by someone else in a in just a slapdash way. It has mm -hmm. to it has to be a good book. But yeah, the Lummy Island one. Ooh, I have like three more signed copies of those. I, I'm not <laughs> sure what I'm gonna do with that. I got into a huge I'm, fight I'm with Craig. <laughs> Well, Craig bought that for me for Christmas this year because we went to that restaurant and that right. and I, when, when I read him the New York Times article, he's like, well, I still think we can keep that book because it's, it's a memento of our trip there and da, da, da. I was like, yeah. I don't know, this guy seems yeah. like a real asshole. Yeah. And, and he got really <laughs> mad. Yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting question because I got rid, I mean, Mario Batali, I mean, this is, we're on such a tangent here, but, yeah. uh, <laughs> but Mar Mario Batali was the reason I got interested in cooking. I mean, I would watch his show religiously on the Food Network. Yeah. And I, when I was in law school, I was like, oh my God, look at that. And I would make like his lamb dishes and like, wow, this is yes. amazing. So, but at the same time, when I, th I draw a distinction between Mario Batali's behavior and like physically harming women and yes, physically yeah. like raping people versus yeah. like Alison Roman, who absolutely like made a mistake. And, but I, I think what happens on Twitter is people get lumped together yeah. and, and this idea of, I mean, 
quote unquote cancel culture, but like, yeah. you know, it's like once you've done your misdeed, it doesn't matter if you are Harvey Weinstein or it doesn't matter if you are yeah. just sweet, like a bad, you know, stupid thing. Like, it's like, well, to me, there is a difference between being Harvey Weinstein and Alice. Yes. Yeah. And, and, um, and you also get to this point where there's no amount of formulating an apology that will work. I mean, right. just, I, I advise people if I can, just don't, don't, don't go there because it's so, you your apology gets made fun of it's not good enough it's mm -hmm. not you know it's not sincere enough it's just like oh it's a yeah. really good position to be in and uh yeah it's <laughs> it, we all we all seem to learn that the hard way as we're sort of coming up and becoming yeah. more well known and, and being interviewed more and, and you just you know you think you're being honest and funny and and off the cuff and then you find yourself in hot water and it's it, extremely stressful and and hard to backtrack from. Well, let's hope this podcast doesn't destroy either of our <laughs> careers. <laughs> really? oh, um, no, but that was that was great. I'm actually really glad we talked about that because I think it's yeah. on everyone's minds a little bit. And I think yeah. in your position, you know, where you're kind of seeing all these books come through, it's interesting to hear your take on it. Yeah. Um, well, we kind of, we, we did a great job, I think. What do you oh, think? Thank you so much. Yes, I <laughs> yeah. have to say my first Zoom experience has been very positive. Oh, good. Well, I hope this, <laughs> I hope this opens a whole new world for you. And, yes. uh, and yes. I can't wait to come to San Francisco and come back to your store and buy I know, some stuff. Me too. I can't wait to see you in person again. All right, Celia. Well, thank you so much. Right. Okay. Have a great rest thank of your day. You. Okay, Bye. you too. Bye.